hey, what is sin? And, and, and why should we care? If they don't even approach what I just said and try to address that, then you've got to be out of your mind as a Christian because you just bought into the biggest con, the con that said you've got cancer even though you didn't know it. And I've got the cure. And, and, you know, it's, you know, it might ring true like homeopathy, you know, like, you know, drink this water and everything will be okay. Uh, the, the water of life is Jesus Christ. And all you really got to do is say something, say you believe, you know, and depending on what church you go to, you know, dunk yourself underwater a little bit, get a little wet. It, it, and then another church, Hey, you can't just say it, man. You've got to do it. You've got to have fruit of the spirit, you know, to prove you're like us. So that's the con, guys. The, the con is you have to believe it. That's it. That's the con. Now, no con is, is really good, you know, w without acquiring something from you. Now, there's great psychological and sociological studies behind religion and, and the transaction that occurs from the individual to the unit, the full community unit. Um, but I'll touch on a couple. Number one, we can all say it, money. There is no American Christian institution that exists without some type of funding if it has bills to pay. All right, I don't need to belabor that. You get it. The shorthand version of me talking about that is they're going to ask you for money and they're going to say you need to give your money because it's your God-given duty to return your tithe uh, to this deity. If you don't do it, you're stealing from God, in other words. All right, so they want your money. Now, who is they? We're not talking about the proverbial they, cloak and daggers, behind the shadows, uh, all that stuff. Now, these are people just like you who bought into it and just happened to take on a ministerial role. And then, I mean, they, they'll have some interesting insights into the, the uh, social economics of how these things are effectively transacted. And what I mean is asking you for money. Um, but that's for a later post. So they're people just like you. Ministers are people just like you and I. Um, they're just in a ministerial role. And now they have a responsibility uh, to be a trailblazer in the culture and community. All right. Another transaction that occurs when uh, the con is laid over you, the con of faith, getting you to believe something that isn't evidently true, is that they themselves believe it. They, I mean, they were conned too. And just like any great multi-level marketing scheme, I'm saying scheme, okay, I know not all multi-level marketing systems are schemes and all that other stuff just follow with me like any other great multi-level marketing system it's not complete without recruiting recruiting other people to believe in the same cause that you were asked to believe in you don't want to be the guy in other words that gets recruited and kind of like looks around and and you're the only one who got recruited because then you might think Wait a minute. Is everybody else seeing something that I might be, you know, a little too dim-witted right in this moment to see? Well, the answer is yes, which is why you go out and do what you're told and continue to recruit. Um, and that's what we do. That's what I did. I wasn't a hardcore evangelist when I was a Christian, by the way, because I've, I've always been a skeptic and critical thinker, and if I couldn't make sense out of the theology... I wasn't the guy on the street yelling at everybody that they were a sinner because I realized that stuff just doesn't go over well. But that's where the con comes in. To effectively place a con, what you have to do is establish a relationship with the person you want to con. You have to establish trust. That's why evangelists know that street evangelism doesn't work. If you look at the statistics, there's something like, it's a crazy amount, 98% of Christians, of American Christians, do not do evangelism. 
evangelism in the standard kind of way you might think door to door knocking going out and seeking the lost out into the lost world they don't do that it, like it's a striking number it is seriously it's above 90 percent uh, go look at the data instead what happens is they do something called community outreach or they hold strategic partners uh, it's like community service charities um, it, whatever just imagine and they develop relationships with the community through that and they recruit through that not only that uh, you know they, they can have the same marketing as you see anywhere else in other commercial advertisement right they'll do radio ads they'll go on TV they'll post ads they'll be in theaters they'll be on your street they'll set up signs and what this does is it creates awareness that a movement like this is existing now if they did just that you might think they're doing an okay job but religion Christianity in America goes one step further than that I call it gimmicks uh, so let's say that awareness that a church exists isn't satisfying enough to you as the minister or the church leadership you need something to draw in a secular crowd to then convert them all right again no con is complete without a relationship with the person you're trying to con <laughs> I just gotta be blunt with that so you will put out a gimmick you'll put out a secular advertisement um, and that secular advertisement can come in the form of secular music like you play secular music in your worship band oh man you go to this church they play secular music how how awesome is that your church is cool man I thought your church might be uptight everybody's wearing a suit but no man you guys look really edgy you know you're you're a bit new agey kind of and you're just accepting you know tattoos piercings you know colored hair you know whatever whatever this whatever the the church has got going on this is why you see the new churches today the ones that are successful they've got their marketing down uh, they look trendy they keep up with the times and they do secular things um, you know they drink alcohol you know they, they just sponsor these different events and, and activities within their church community so once they get you in the door and then you see hey this is actually kind of cool you might you might be tempted to draw a false correlation here's the false correlation hey you guys are cool Jesus must be real <laughs> that's the false correlation uh, when you draw that false correlation hey you guys are cool you guys are accepting of me you know I'm looking at all of you who says Jesus is real and that you guys all have a relationship with this personal God maybe you guys are telling the truth and maybe I want to be a part of that what that will actually look like when I'm in the thick of it I don't know but I can at least say I want to be a part of it right and then voila before you know it somebody does a baptism video interview and a baptism and then the person is now sitting in a chair every Sunday and they're excited with their new experience and they want to start serving so they start serving you know to take the next step a lot of churches have something called next steps um, there's a few of them right down the street here who literally call it next steps um, and then you get involved in small groups and then before you know it what you suspected was an actual correlation you can now arrive at a, an intelligent decision on whether that was actual correlation or not and you can say at that point no it's not an actual correlation it's just one that my mind drew a pattern on and uh, but now I know that's not true uh, but yet I love the community here everybody's cool you know hopefully everybody's cool and now you're invested though I mean you might not have had the very private conversation of how much you actually believe in all of this but on the outside you're invested and if you change your outside appearance it's now gonna look like you turned your back on your new community who is so hospitable to you and invited you in and now you're gonna look like the jerk unless you have a very good reason some people's very good reasons look like I don't have time to go to church for any more anymore uh, I'm moving my job schedule doesn't allow me you know and churches hate that because they see it as excuses uh, but really it's just them trying to let you down gently anyways back to the person who may or may not be experiencing dissonance with their new church family and what they actually are observing to be evidently true or false um, that person now has relationships and if that church is, is involved in any kind of outreach at all whether it's 
marketing, actually passing out things on the street, going to secular events to, you know, form relationships and invite people to the church. That person is, is now in a position where they are thinking about recruiting other people. Sometimes this looks like sending out tweets from your church when your pastor says something tweet worthy, you know, all the, everything, everything. So now you've been recruited to recruit. Why? Because you've invested your time, you don't want to look like an idiot now. And you don't want to just back out of the whole thing, even though, you know, everybody's cool. So you hang out for a while and you do the thing until maybe it becomes just like so ingrained in your head that you're just like, you know what, I'm just going to go with this and yeah, I'm just going to go with it. And I see how it's okay to th say things like, yeah, God is real because everybody responds positively to such thing like that. But let's say one day you actually start taking your Christian walk super, super seriously. You go to university and you start studying, you start realizing the very first thing that got you involved in Christianity in the first place was a lie, like commerciology, the study of sin, the fact that you're a sinner, the thing that predicates or premises your Christian walk and relationship in the first place is something that is entirely not understood, easily debunked, and evidently only imaginary. Something that's simply not true. And if you take truth or falsi uh, falsifiability, I may have just made that up just there, <laughs> seriously at all, you will have a hard choice to make at that point in your life. By the way, the person I just described was me, okay? But, uh, that whole scenario that I just described, that hypothetical scenario, that was me. Now you'll have a choice to make. The choice you make is you double down on your search for truth no matter where that leads you. Or you excuse that journey that nobody seems to want to go on. And you continue to hang out with your friends. You continue to give your money. You continue to tell other people things that you no longer really believe is true. And you spend another 10 to 20 years doing just that until you get older and you realize that some of the bigoted speech just really isn't necessary. That some of the beliefs about hell and that our loved ones go there just because they either one didn't read the Bible and learn the message that we learned or two decided to believe in it when it has so many other competitors throughout history like we did you get older and you realize a lot of this stuff is just nonsense and it's just hate and above all it's not evidently true but I'm too old now I'm too old now I've, I've been in the gig for far too long and I don't want to leave. I've had these friends for far too long. And if I were to ever come out and say, hey, all this, come on, all this isn't evidently true. You know what will happen. The thing that you were conned into and, and all the relationships that you made in your community and your retirement, you know, your twilight years in your life will be taken away from you. And that, my friends, is the price you pay. When you believe that what you imagine to be real is so, is evidently true. When you believe it's evidently true, but it's not. And that is why this group, Fully Deconverted, exists. That is why I decided to promote a conversation about these things and invite everybody in from all sides. Because if we're not learning from each other and we're just believing what people who millennia ago died, but before they did, told other people things, that we have to fall in line with that? We don't. And by the way, Christianity is not what Christianity started off as. Christianity today is, would be unrecognizable to Christianity when it first started. You need to know that. And if you don't know that, I encourage you. I got a book right here. It's called The Story of Christianity, written by Justo L. Gonzalez. That's one of my books I had to buy for school. I love reading that book um, because even though it's Christian, you know, propaganda or whatever, um, if all you got to do is read it and you realize the God story is really just a man's story. 
Anyways, I'm grateful for all of you here. I'm grateful for the discussions that we have. And I'm grateful most of all for our minds that allow us to uphold the principle of the disenfranchisement of dogma and look at every idea with a critical eye and decide, is deism the best approach at you know what is evidently true or, or is something else? Is, is, is it a Christian God? Is it, is it nothing like we, you know, we're all just emergent um, you know, from more base forms of reality? You know, who knows what it is? But if you're young enough and if you're brave enough, you still have that ability to go on the journey that everybody else got conned out of and see where that journey leads you. It's full of darkness and chaos because nobody's gone before you and nobody has tamed that wild environment, tamed that knowledge. You can be the person who goes out there and does that and that journeys back and tells the rest of us what you found. <laughs>